This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Case IH. Coming up on this weekend's broadcast, we pay attention to some of the weather adversity that can come to our farms and ranches. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our broadcast this weekend. It's a pleasure to be able to join you once more with the Traveling Man. Where have you been speaking? You know, it has been a good couple of weeks. Had the chance to get a little warm in Tucson, Arizona. I've seen Fargo, North Dakota a few times and Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Max, getting my fill of the plains. Folks should know if you need a good speaker for a farm meeting, this guy's a good speaker for a farm <laughs> meeting. Well, thank you, Max. I do enjoy it. It is a tremendous amount of fun and get to talk with farmers. You learn a lot from producers, no doubt. And one thing that comes to mind is not far ahead is calving season. We'll start to, we'll start to see photographs of calves in the bathroom tub, calves being rescued. Sometimes they're in the kitchen of the house, but it's a real commitment for our producers. It certainly is, Max. That is true. And that season, as you mentioned, is coming very soon. In fact, it's getting started for some early producers. Lori Boyer in northeastern Colorado had the chance to check in with ranchers in that area. I don't know if we're any more unique than any other rancher. Just we try to do our best to raise the best good food that we can. For Deb Wacker, working her family cattle operation has been extra difficult this winter so far in northeast Colorado. With Colorado experiencing several days of up to minus 14 degrees, we are setting records for cold days not seen in 38 years. Not to mention more snow than usual for the state. Statewide snowpack at the time of this video is at 120% of the median level and well above average in all river basins except for the Arkansas and Upper Rio Grande. Wacker Farms sits in the South Platte River Basin. Wacker, along with her husband and son, own and operate Wacker Farms where they not only grow feed such as sugar beets for pulp, but run 450 mama cows and about 20 bulls on their cow herd. At the time of the story, they had four early calves with more to come this spring. While she is more passionate about the cows, Jared and her husband Chris like the farming side better. She said Jared wants to take over the operation in the future. Wacker shares the story of her operation on social media by posting photos of her cows, which she calls her pretty girls and her babies. Wacker does have concerns about the future of the ag industry. I'm afraid there's a crash coming. Oh, yeah? Things are too good right now as far as the prices and things and feed prices are the highest we've ever seen, which is really terrifying when you have this many mouths yeah. to feed. It's really scary. So if the prices would crash, I'm afraid there's going to be a lot of people go bankrupt. And that really, that really bothers me. In addition to this year's harsh cold winter conditions, the Wackers suffered a devastating fire in the early morning hours of January 2nd. In that fire, they lost several bottles of cattle medicine, bedding, a tractor, and a whole lot more. They continue to try to dig out the remnants of the fire, but it has been so cold and such frozen conditions. She says it's been hard to get to. For This Week in Agribusiness, I'm Lori Boyer. Well, thank you for that update, and we certainly hope the weather breaks soon and they can get cleaned up after that fire. That was Lori Boyer from KSIR, keeping the residents around Fort Morgan engaged with what's happening in the ag industry. But women aren't just active on the ranch. Of course, they're active out in the community as well throughout cow country. When I was in New Orleans with the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, I had the chance to talk with Reba Mazak. She's the past president of the American National Cattle Women, and I asked her what those women do to keep the story of beef moving out in public. We stand on the same three pillars that we were founded on, and that is beef promotion, education and development, and legislation. And those look differently now. My goodness, if 70 years ago somebody thought that we would just get on our telephone and take a picture and talk about our cattle, that people would be interested in that. They, they couldn't even think about that. That was the time of uh, party lines, you know, um, back in the day. So as an organization, we just continue to move with the times. Whatever that time is demanding, we try and, and make sure that we're on the cusp of that as well. You were president during the 70-year celebration. Reba, what was it like working with the organization and working with the folks who make it successful? It was incredible to have such a support system through our partners at NCBA and CBB and then the American National Cattlewomen. You know, we have a history that is just incredible. And these ladies that are leaders of our organization are in a leadership ladder. We have made a commitment of four plus years to be in the leadership. So we have been uh, tuned, hopefully by this point, at fine-tuned, you know, but have an idea of how, how to operate our organization, but who to know and how to speak to people. 
Well, thank you to Reba for that update. And if you're interested in being more active with the American National Cattle Women, visit their website, ancw.org. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone Ag. The Firestone Ag Dealer Network offers you the support, inventory, and resources you need. Visit FirestoneAg.com to find your local certified dealer. Well, it's time now to take a look at the markets. And this past week, we saw the release of the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates for February. Usually not too much of a market mover, but it does fall while we're waiting for those Brazilian crops to come to market. There's a lot on the mind of market watchers. And joining us this week is Dale Durkholz of Grain Cycles. Dale, thanks for joining us. Hey, good to be here. World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates, Dale, the WASDE, not too many changes coming from USDA this month. What did we see on the corn side of the ledger? You know, on the corn side, they uh, took 25 million out of the ethanol, which is really just small potatoes in one sense. Uh, you know, when you look at the trends of the ethanol grind we've had so far, there isn't anything that really jumps out. I mean, they could have left it unchanged, but they obviously had their reasons to reduce it. And basically that 25 million bushel was carried right on through and added back to the ending stocks number themselves this year. Yeah, Dale, given the ethanol industry, that, that slowdown, you mentioned you didn't expect to see much of a cut. Has the grind been continuing at its uh, historical pace? Uh, it, it's not far off the mark at this particular juncture in time. I track it weekly. I track gasoline usage weekly. And the one thing that I guess I was a little bit surprised they took it off when you start looking around, reading a lot of the news, you know, the 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 businesses of the world, let's say, here in the U.S. are starting to demand that, that their employees come back in and work in the office again. So I don't really see the weakness in gasoline demand going forward. And with that, you know, you kind of wonder, you know, are our ethanol grinds really going to sag that much? Or are we going to hold a little bit stronger here than, than what we have the last couple of years? So I, I don't think they're far off the mark. I just I think they could have left it unchanged. They reduced to 25, and, and that's really a small, small change, realistically. It is, Dale. I know that some market watchers were anticipating perhaps a further reduction in expected corn exports, but that didn't materialize in February, did it? No, it didn't, and I think they're basically waiting to get a little bit deeper into the marketing year itself because, you know, we're, we, we've changed the, the export seasonals as far as corn are concerned, just like we had in beans because of Brazil. And we're really right now coming into the period where export sales are going to start to ramp up, shipments are going to start to ramp up because bean shipments are tailing off at this juncture. And so I, I suspect the USDA is going to wait until we get another month, maybe even two months into the marketing year before they really make a downward adjustment. But certainly the corn exports have have been soft and, and they argue that, you know, we could see that number soften a little bit more here again. And it wouldn't surprise me that next month they don't take 50 million out of it. But, you know, I think it's just too early for them considering we're at a point in the season where those numbers should ramp up quite a bit. They should. We should see that American corn start to move off while that Brazilian corn, that second crop, Safrina, goes in the ground. Dale, did the USDA adjust any global corn production numbers on their WASDE? Well, they made some minor adjustments in them. I didn't see anything that really jumped out and, you know, neither did the trade at that, at that point to say that, you know, we really see anything uniquely different at this point. I think the one thing we've got to be watchful of at this juncture in time when we look around is keeping an eye on South America and it's more in Brazil than, than maybe in, in Argentina itself because Brazil corn exports from their last year's crop, which was a small crop, carried along a lot further than people thought they would. So you kind of think they've moved some of that first crop corn into the pipeline and they may need to keep more of this second crop in the bin, you know, keep it domestically to feed it there. So, you know, we may not see the kind of big second crop flesh come out of Brazil as, as we move through the spring and into early summer. Uh, and so with that, maybe that's why the USDA didn't really change that export estimate number much, even though export sales and shipments have been soft. All right. Lots to discuss here as we look at the global production figures. We'll talk about those in the soybean side with Dale when we return. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone Ag. Harvey Firestone invented the first pneumatic farm tire, forever changing what it means to farm hard. Visit FirestoneAg.com to learn more about this history and tire solutions for today. 
Welcome back. We're talking markets with Dale Dirkholz of Grain Cycles. And Dale, on the wheat side, we did not see any changes in this most recent uh, WASDE report, did we? No, we really didn't. And nobody, like on corn and beans, nobody was looking for any big changes, as it were, anyway. You know, with the wheat, uh, I think probably two stories are really a, a bigger issue that people are trying to, to feel their way around at this point. Number one being, you know, the, the disparity in size between what the USDA and what the Russians think last year's Russian wheat crop was. We're only about 10 million ton apart, I think. And the other one, which came up really more recently at this point, was a news item out of India suggesting they may be getting poised at this juncture to, to go ahead and suspend wheat export sales again. So people need to keep their eye on that if that happens. It can give a little bit of life into the wheat export business out of the U.S. It certainly could. Dale will be watching for additional news out of India. But the topic right now in the trade seems to be the soybean market. We're watching what's coming out of Brazil. Dale, did we see any massive changes on this most recent WASDE report? Well, we didn't see any big thing. They reduced the Argentine crop a little bit. Uh, Brazil really didn't change, you know, and I think everybody's really kind of going along trying to understand, you know, how big is Brazil's crop? Everybody believes it's big. Nobody has come up with a solid number, but it's going to be somewhere in the low 150 million ton territory. Uh, some people think maybe the mid 150 million ton, and there's some people in Argentina that instead of the 41 million ton crop the usda projected want to talk about a crop down to 35 but i really think when i look at yield that goes along with that for argentina that's a little bit of a stretch yeah okay that'll be interesting to watch develop dale i'm curious about that argentinian situation we know they're running short on beans they're very very dry are they going to be importing beans from brazil or elsewhere to keep their crush plants going or would they shut down that sector if if they can't get the product no, they won't shut it down. They'll they'll continue to move the move the product out into the world pipeline as they can at this point. You know, the one thing we got to keep in mind, you know, Paraguay, most of the beans that Paraguay produces on a good year, 10 million ton this year, you know, USDA is still about that. I think eight and a half or something like that might be a little bit more appropriate, but that's a lot better than last year, which is a 4 million ton. But the point is the Paraguayan crop, it basically moves through the Argentine merchandising pipeline. So I think what will happen instead of seeing Paraguay beans come into the world pipeline, they're going to stay in Argentina and get processed on into meal and oil itself. We may see a few beans rotate down from Brazil. I think that'll come from the southern harvest by and large because of transportation logistics rather than bringing them all the way from the north. But, you know, I, I don't think that's going to be hugely disruptive, but they're going to still process at a pretty good pace. Might be down a little bit from last year, but it'll still be a big number. Well, speaking of processing coming down, we saw incredible crush for bean oil domestically here over the past year. Dale, it looks like that trend is now to the downside. Is that the case? Yeah, they took 15 million bushel out of uh, the soybean crush estimate there on, on the WASDE this week, you know, uh, and I, I worry that that could be a little bit deeper. In fact, even one thing, if you note, in, instead of watching bean exports, look at bean oil exports. And, and yeah, they're kind of the third rail in one sense of, you know, the, the soybean complex at this point in terms of the export picture, but our bean export sales are about 10% of what they were last year. And so if those continue to stay soft, even amid, you know, all the excitement about, you know, food demand for bean oil and, and fuel demand for bean oil, I think we could see the bean crush itself maybe moderate a little bit there, really kind of tied more, do we keep meal supplies, you know, levels we really need to service demand for that. So. We could see a little bit of, of reduction in that crush number again yet along the way. All right, folks, Dale Durkholz of Grain Cycles. Chad Colby's look at agriculture technology comes your way next, brought to you by the IBM Watson Decision Platform. Combining AI with Internet of Things data to help agribusiness increase yields, improve quality, and drive sustainability. I was being interviewed on the radio the other day. A guy in Chicago asked me, what in the world are farmers doing this time of the year? They don't have much to do, do they? Chad Colby would remind everybody that there's plenty of shop time and other things that have to go on on the farm. Most growers were super fortunate last fall to have an exceptional fall in terms of getting the crops out. With me on the show this week is Mike Dewis. Mike farms in eastern Illinois. 
Mike, talk first a little bit about last fall. I know you got the crops out in a real short order. Yeah, last fall was was really good for Iroquois County. Uh, we started later than what we thought we would. Uh, we we didn't get started till about the first of October, but once we got started, we really did no delays. Maybe two days where we weren't able to harvest, and our county was very fortunate. We had we had strong yields, and and it, it worked out real well. So that always sets up really good for the next year. You don't have to go back and clean up the mess you made in the fall. Is anything changing on your program? What plans do you have for spring as far as that goes? You know, we, we're not changing a lot. We, we've made a shift over to some strip till, um, really exploring that, uh, making a shift to the strip till on the corn. Uh, other than that, not really much different. What about equipment? Lots of shops are busy, lots of planter, grower meetings, all those things are happening this time of year. Mid-February, have you started prepping planters yet? We have not. Uh, we, uh, we have a brand new soybean planter. Uh, we've got to set up. We've got to learn quite a bit about it. Uh, it's the new Case IH2150S, so it's, it's a brand new planter. Um, so there, there's a little bit of a learning curve. Uh, corn planter uh, won't take more than a few days. What about the weather? It's middle of February. We're wearing sweatshirts here in central Illinois, and they're talking about some pretty substantial moisture coming here now. Let's talk a little bit about that. Anything that have your concern at all? Yeah, you know, as farmers, we always want moisture in the winter. I mean, it's a great time to get the soil profile. Uh, we're a little bit dry. I know farther west uh, is extremely dry, so farmers are always wanting to replenish the, the, the moisture. Uh, a mild February, uh, 40 degrees, uh, not much frost. I don't know that we know what that's gonna mean for, for spring, but uh, it's, it's a little bit different. What other things do you have uh, on your radar in terms of challenges for this spring? Anything technology-wise? Are you doing anything different there maybe with your new planter this year that you've done different in the past? We're going to try uh, some liquid starter with the, the soybean planter. Uh, I know there hasn't been a lot of consistency with, with trials in that nature, but uh, we're going we're gonna to try some things and, and uh, see if we like it and, and move forward. For This Week in Agribusiness, I'm Chad Colby. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness, where we are enjoying each week helping you tour America to see the ag states of America. With the assistance of the folks of Pivot Bio, Charlie Behrens gives us a look state by state at the ag industry and the commodities that are produced. This week it's North Carolina, very diverse in agriculture, all the way from Winston-Salem up north down to Wilmington, or from Boone on the west over to Bell Haven on the east. Here's Charlie. The United States of America can be very different from one state to another, but one thing every state has in common is agriculture. Hey everyone, I'm Charlie Behrens and welcome to the Agricultural States of America. We're going to test your knowledge about the agriculture of different states and hopefully give you a bit of appreciation for all the great things that farmers are producing across America. Today we're talking about a state that has agriculture as its leading industry that produces more than 150 agricultural products with a $9 billion economic impact. It's also home to the oldest state university in the nation, founded over 233 years ago in 1789. In fact, basketball legend Michael Jordan played for him back in the day. He shoots! Air ball since I'm the one shooting. That's right, we are talking about North Carolina. North Carolina is an extremely diverse agricultural state with more than 52,000 farms across 8.5 million acres of farmland, including over 1,600 century-old family farms. Just to provide some context, here's a short list of all the things North Carolina is a top producer of in the U.S. Sweet potatoes, tobacco, Christmas trees, turkeys, trout, strawberries, pickling cucumbers, eggs, blueberries, peaches, peanuts, apples, catfish, watermelons, tomatoes, corn, soybeans, cotton, cattle, grapes, bell peppers, squash, to name a few. I think you get the idea. North Carolina is basically the Michael Jordan of agriculture. The state also ranks third in the nation for raising hogs and fourth in the nation for broiler chickens. But can you guess which crop North Carolina reigns number one in? I'll give you a clue. It's sweet. I'll give you another clue. It's a potato. If you guess sweet potato, I don't know where you came up with that answer, but you would be correct. Now I know what some of you are thinking. Is a sweet potato really a vegetable? 
Well, unlike a potato, which is a tuber, the sweet potato is a root vegetable that grows underground. So, root vegetable, yes, it is a vegetable. And sweet potatoes are actually very rich in antioxidants called beta carotene, which helps boost vitamin A, and they are full of nutrients and fibers that make you feel fuller for a longer period of time. So, you know, maybe that upcharge for sweet potato fries is actually worth it after all. Sweet potatoes can also be boiled, steamed, and even baked. And thank goodness North Carolina grows enough sweet potatoes. 1.7 billion pounds a year to be specific. That's enough to make 850 million sweet potato casseroles, which would only require 557 million pounds of marshmallows. Who wants to play Chubby Bunny? Also, did you know North Carolina is second in the nation for growing Christmas trees? That's right, with over 1,300 farms on more than 40,000 acres in and around the Blue Ridge Mountains, North Carolina grows more than 20% of our nation's yuletide trees, cutting in excess of 4 million each year. 99% of Christmas trees grown in North Carolina are Fraser firs, which are shipped to every state in the US, as well as the Caribbean islands, Mexico, Canada, Bermuda, and Japan. Now, I don't wanna get sappy here, but what would Christmas be like without North Carolina? Ho, ho, ho. And Christmas isn't the only holiday that North Carolina makes festive. In fact, the state started to gain notoriety for growing pumpkins as well. And while the lion's share of pumpkins grow in Midwestern states like Illinois, North Carolina is ranked number four nationally in the production of pumpkins with 94 million pounds produced annually. This growth has been spurred on by the pumpkin-friendly climate in the northeastern part of the state and the strong demand throughout the southeastern part of the country. I mean, you know what they say in the south, there ain't nothing sweeter than a pumpkin pie on an autumn afternoon. I actually don't know if they say that, but you know, it's got a nice ring to it. Anyway, that's all we have for now, but you can go to pivotbio.com slash agstates and click on the show icon to explore more about the agriculture in your favorite states and test your knowledge to win great prizes and more. All right, we'll see you next time on the Agricultural States of America. I'm gonna go make a sweet potato casserole and maybe play Chubby Money, I don't know. Well, Charlie didn't even get into that sweet potato yam debate. Which is it? Well, generally, if you're enjoying the flavor of that vegetable, it's a sweet potato. We may call it a yam. My mother always fixed her candied yams, but it is very likely a sweet potato. He didn't even talk about the great festival and fairs in that uh, state. Every spring, they have what is called the Got to Be in Sea Festival. That's in the month of May. We've been there many, many times. It's a great showcase for the agriculture industry. It's a little mini state fair in the spring. And they have a great antique tractor show as a part of it. I've announced the parade for that show many years there. Got to Be in Sea, it's called, in May. And then the state fair itself comes along about the middle part of October. And the people take great pride in their state fair in North Carolina, as we've seen many times over the years. We're proud to be seen on local television stations all across the country, including Saturday and Sunday mornings in Greenville. We appreciate the station there being among those carrying this week in agribusiness. Don't forget to go to the website, pivotbio.com slash agstates where you can see more in this wonderful series. There's more coming up on This Week in Agribusiness. Stay with us here. This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Case IH. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. Max, as this new Congress takes shape, we're seeing ag policy issues move to the center. The lobbyists are headed to Capitol Hill, and those who work for Farm Bureau have their marching orders with their policy in hand after their annual meeting a few days ago. I talked about that this week with the president of the American Farm Bureau, Georgia farmer Zippy Duvall. I asked him about the writing of that farm bill just ahead, if he's concerned about the debate over nutrition programs distracting from the agriculture portion of it. Well, I think it's a good possibility that they may use that as uh, leverage to get things they want done. And, and uh, we've got to make sure as an industry and as farmers and ranchers that we encourage our congressmen and senators uh, that our food security and our national is, is our national security and it's nothing to be played with. We need to make sure we get this farm bill done and get it done on time. And you got to have farmers to be able to feed people. And there are people in this country that is not as 
fortunate and others that do need those feeding programs. So they go hand in hand. It should be called a farm and food bill instead of a farm bill. And uh, and and we we're going to work real hard to try to keep them together and advocate to get both uh, both things done. Are there one or two top priorities within the Farm Bill and the matters that really matter to Farm Bureau members have, as proposed in your policy? Sure. One of the things that we were uh, <clears throat> asking our uh, our delegates was, are we willing to uh, ask for uh, increase in the baseline uh, of the Farm Bill? Uh, we've been reluctant to do that over the years. Uh, we're all concerned about the, the heavy debt load that our country carries. Uh, but if you look at the last couple of years and the cost of production uh, going so high of producing commodities that we produce, uh, uh, we we realize that that that, that, that those expansions that baseline's got to be expanded to be make up for those extra costs that's costing us to produce the food for this country. I told Zippy Duvall I've been hearing from some Farm Bureau leaders they're concerned about ESG, the Environmental Social Governance Push whether or not that might result in a rating system of farms where crop insurance premiums could be affected, where interest rates and financial institutions might be impacted. I asked Zippy DeBall if he's concerned about it. it it's a big concern of ours, and we, we are uh, very supportive of uh, any climate uh, uh, smart practices, uh, but we, need to, we, we believe that it all needs to be um, uh, voluntary, market-based and market-driven uh, and we because we know that our farmers respond to that if you look historically uh, in conservation programs in the conservation title uh, our farmers have uh, voluntarily uh, stepped up and put 140 million acres in conservation uh, and that's the size of california and new york put together uh, so our farmers have proven if you put a practice out there for them uh, help participate with them, help them put it on the ground, that they'll voluntarily do the things for uh, conserving our natural resources and protecting our climate. With the Chinese balloon event in recent days, there's a lot of concern about our relationship with that nation, a big customer of ours. We're important to them. But now we see that there's a real push in regard to maybe limiting their ability to invest in land or facilities in some of our states. Well, is there farm policy re relating to that within Farm Bureau? It, it is, and our farmers are very concerned with that. And I know if you look at the uh, all the, the statistics, only uh, three percent of the farmland is owned by foreign in entities. Uh, but that is a um, a very con a big concern of our farmers. That you know, who's going to be growing our crops in the future? Who's going to be the farmers? And are they going to be uh, people, uh, young people from uh, our country, or will it be owned by foreign? Uh, because, you know, if you look at our country and how peaceful we stay, it's because we have a plentiful amount of food and all of it in good quality. And that's what keeps a, a country safe, and it's what keeps it peaceful, is that everybody has food available to them. And, and that's the, why we need to make sure that, uh, uh, that farmland stays in farmers' hands. So Farm Bureau leaders and those in other groups will have much to talk about in their annual lobbying trips to Washington. Those will be coming up in just a few weeks. Greg Solier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead. Presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. Well, little by little, it appears we're chipping away at the drought over the continental United States. The West is better. The East is better. What about the Plain States now, Greg? It'll be their turn this week. You may not like exactly what comes on down, but it'll be coming on down. And with time on each and every weather system, we continue to nibble away at uh, the worst of the drought pattern. Not necessarily across the West, kind of a hiatus, as you would expect. And as we have talked about here, even on a fading lining, you set up. And it is an onshore flow west to east here fairly mild winds and these are the Chinook winds and we have basically eradicated the snow cover and the snowpack in the eastern parts of Montana. The western Dakota is a different story farther to the east and uh, maybe in the coming week we'll get something farther on south. But again, a pretty quiet weather picture into the Pacific Northwest early in the week. Note the cold air return. The stratosphere is warming again. The polar vortex is on the move and a lobe of it shifts southward and yeah, we'll put down some accumulating snow. Black Hills on southward and eastward winter 
thunderstorm potential, seasonal temperatures and an onshore flow here with the system. So some good news, some additional moisture after a bit of a break into the Pacific Northwest, but nothing too impressive, nor with the system coming across the southwestern parts of the country. The CR range holding at about 130% of normal precip snowpack, if you will. That's about 30 inches of uh, rainfall, but we haven't added to it. That's an average spread all the way into the beginning part of April as we end the rain se rainy season. So again, not a lot of excitement here with additional moisture. We do get something in the desert southwest and nice to see the moisture last week into the central and southern high plains. And this week, middle to late parts of the week, Max, it'll be a winter storm with colder air on the move, but at least it's moisture in one form or another, including rainfall farther east and south in Texas. Over the next few weeks, folks in the heart of the country will be watching closely for the extremes in weather, especially with calving season coming. Yes, and there's more cold air. There's a lot of cold air relative to the fact that we're here through the mid to late stretches of uh, winter time. And even with this very mild start to the week across the plains, it's a downslope flow of the Chinook flow into the northern and central high plains. Pretty quiet weather picture. A lot of soft and muddy grounds across the Corn Belt. Hopefully you're not tracking that through the kitchen. And look what happens here. Middle to late parts of the week, a nice upper air trough. Low pressure begins to come up out of the southern plains. A look at the precip in one form or another from soaking rains, additional rains by the inch or more eastern and southern Corn Belt to a corridor of ice and then accumulating snow, winter storm potential from the Arrowhead on southward and note the cold air again building through the Canadian Prairie, settling south and westward with time. That'll be an active storm track that these boundaries kind of run along here in the weeks to come. One weak weather system out of the Delta region, new low pressure spinning out of the southwestern part of the country, the Rio Grande, a little drabble of rain for parts of Arizona, West Texas, but the moisture does increase and the drought relief does increase. Showers and thunderstorms heavy and severe here. Livestock managers watch the shift from rain over to ice and snow into the Oklahoma Panhandle points west and northward. So some severe storms, but I don't see any widespread outbreak that you're talking about here. Yeah, here and there, kind of clustered, scattered. We don't think this will be, you know, the start of the severe weather season, although when's it start and when does it really end this time of the year in the southern states? And we saw it here back in December and January as far north as the parts of the Corn Belt, where early on in the week, weak weather system on through very little frost or freeze to the ground and the snow melt continues coming off recent significant rain. Keep a steady eye on these streams and rivers now here, not only now in the weeks to come. This could be a winder upper, a nor'easter early in the week into the northeast of New England, then middle to late parts of the week. It's colder air on the move into the western Corn Belt, a shift from rain to ice to snow here. More shower and thunderstorm activity into the Ohio Valley and a mixture into the Canadian Prairie. So an active weather pattern across the Corn Belt this week and coming out of Texas and Oklahoma. Showers and thunderstorms early in the week here. Dry time over the southeastern part of the country, the leftover nor'easter, bringing a few spots of rain into the eastern Carolinas. It'll be widespread moisture, including severe weather. Showers and thunderstorms in the southeast, and watch the shift over to rain. Maybe some snow as far south as Oklahoma late in the week. Greg Sodia is back with his extended farm weather forecast for the country, presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. It's a week of big farm shows. Tulare, California, they're hoping for good weather for the World Ag Expo. It starts on Tuesday in Louisville, Kentucky for the Farm Machinery Show. What do you see? I think, uh, well, down there later on into the week, it's a busy one into the Ohio Valley. Much of that central, uh, eastern through southern Corn Belt part of the country has been very wet. Little, if any, frost or freeze to the ground. An inch or two, maybe some spots locally up to three. The specter of flooding mid to late winter style coming into play. And with another warm up, keep an eye on the streams and rivers for additional ice melt and uh, certainly ice jamming. Severe weather down through Dixie. Significant moisture here for the central and south end of the High Plains and a winter storm for the upper Midwest into the Canadian Prairie later into the week away from the California Foreign Farm Show. Significant moisture to the Pacific Northwest. So it is a busy weather pattern, Max. Uh, take a look at it here. This is the way it's going to play out here, I think, in the weeks to come. Looks like some warmer weather for some folks there. How do you see the week of February 20th then? A wide range of temperatures across the country, more or less mid to late winter feel with a lobe of cold, the polar vortex on the move, stratospheric warming here over the northwestern half of the country. In contrast, some of this warmth that continues on, great with comfort in mind, not great with footing, with little if any significant frost or freeze of the ground in that trough across the middle part of the country sets up a classic setup. Systems drop in from the Pacific Northwest. They 
they wind up across Oklahoma and Kansas, lift to the north and northeast. It'll be a wide plume of moisture uh, from severe weather at the Ohio and southward. Winter storm potential from Kansas into the upper Midwest and significant moisture too. additional drought relief for the West. The week that we transition into March, will it arrive like a lion or lamb? Much like a lion, we anticipate. Look at the lobe of coal, the warmth suppressed to the east and south. The jet stream shows little change in uh, position here. So systems again will be making their way along this boundary right here. Here is the boundary and here is the storm track up, mind you, into the Pacific Northwest. Normal precip, that's still snowfall here into the upper Midwest, northern plains, a little drier than average Canadian prairie. Lots of late season snow from West Texas across the heart of the Corn Belt. More severe weather down Dixie ways. Let's see the week of March 6th. Uh, from a weather standpoint, I tell you, busy one. The cold air is locked into position. This is kind of a snapshot going deeper into spring, not necessarily much below, but cold air laid out across the northern part of the country, southern California to the southeastern states. Here is the warmth. It is a trough across the middle part of the country. Widespread significant moisture across the west, the heartland, the Corn Belt into the northeast and New England. Next on this week in agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed. Spotlighting another great American tractor. I continue to be surprised at the outpouring of love for the Alice Chalmers WD-45. But I've continued to hear from some of you folks out there just how special that tractor was or is. And this one, well, you have to look hard to see the tractor because it has a Marbeat on it. Max's Tractor Shed is being brought to you by the folks at Mystic Lubricants. With the help of Mystic Lubes, you can keep your machines working harder for longer. Season after season, Mystic Lubricants, made to make it last. Well, this WD-45 was very nicely restored, but what's on it was nicely restored as well. This is a Marbeet Harvester, a sugar beet harvester at Bieber Farms. That's in Northeast Montana, pretty close to the North Dakota state line. Jeff Bieber shared with me that his dad did the fine restoration on this combination. The Marbeet Harvesters came out of California at Rio Vista, Black Welder Manufacturing made these for eight decades. They made tomato harvesters, forklifts, pruning towers, and the Marbeet Sugar Beet Harvester. I don't know about you, but it really makes an old tractor special, I think, when you have a great implement trailing it or mounted on it, such as the Bieber Family WD-45 at Fairview, Montana. Let's find out what's selling at Big Iron. Here's Mark Stock. Max, uh, we are in our winter season and some of the largest farm shows are being conducted during this time period, including the National Farm Machinery Show in Louisville, Kentucky. We hope that you stop by and visit with the Big Iron folks and Sullivan Auctioneer people at that show, as well as the World Ag Expo in Tulare, California will be taking place this week also. Well, Max, we've been hearing about the lowest numbers of cattle in our 60-year history and Big Iron is selling livestock every week now for the next several weeks. February 13th is the Jorgensen Influence female sale. Then on Valentine's Day, February the 14th, folks, check out the livestock that is being sold on BigIron.com. And then on February 15th, Max, 870 items sell on the Wednesday edition of BigIron.com, including items from the Donald McCormick Estate in Harpers Ferry, Iowa. This sale features two Case IH 7110 tractors. There's a 2015 Ford F-250 pickup. This is a regular cab with 41,000 miles. The fall the following week on Monday, February the 20th in Carthage, Illinois, Sullivan Auctioneers put together an outstanding collector car sale and they have some unbelievable, highly sought after collector cars that will sell to the highest bidder. So if you're looking for land, if you're looking for livestock, if you're looking for machinery and classic cars, there's one stop shop, Max. Our FFA Chapter Tribute is brought to you by Pioneer, developing new generations of seed innovations for new generations of farmers. Pioneer, what's next happens here. We're getting to know FFAers from around the country, and this week we're going to the Northeast. Joining us is Maya Lefebvre. She's the president of the New York FFA. Maya, thanks for joining us this week. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Maya, think back to when you got involved in FFA, and what was it that prompted you to join that organization? 
Yeah, absolutely. So my mother works in my school and she's friends with my ag teacher. And I was a very um, shy, introverted kid. I didn't have a lot of extracurricular interests. And she really wanted me to join FFA because of how much it helps kids grow out of their shells. And I haven't looked back since and I'm really glad she pushed me to make that decision way back in sixth grade. What were some of the projects you worked on as a member that kept you excited about FFA? So in FFA, we have something called a supervised agricultural experience. Each kid gets to do their own, and it's kind of an experimental project we get to have that we get to design ourselves based on the things we're interested about in the ag industry. And my SAE is in plant science. During COVID, I planted my own community garden in my backyard to help my family members and neighbors that couldn't afford fresh vegetables. And just that element of being able to help people and grow my own food was really fascinating to me, and I've just kept with it since. And now you're serving as president of the New York FFA. Maya, what are you looking forward to this year? Well, I ran for president because I absolutely love, as I said, helping people and I love interacting with members. My favorite thing about FFA events was meeting new people and making new friends and making new connections. So I'm really looking forward to possibly serving as a role model for those kids that are in FFA that started off the way I did. And I'm really looking forward to helping spread FFA to different schools around New York. Helping spread FFA, that's such a crucial component of the message is getting it out there, getting that next generation involved. Maya, we wish you the best of luck in your future. Thank you so much for having me today. This time of the year, we like to call attention to a problem on many farms across this country. Grain bin entrapment is a very real concern. It continues to be a problem. And the folks at Nationwide continue to work on that with Grain Bin Safety Week every year in February. Joining us is the president of agribusiness with Nationwide. Here's Brad Liggett. Brad, where are you today as you travel across the United States? I know you're on the road quite often. Yeah, uh, thanks, Maxie. I'm down in Orlando, Florida at the uh, National Conference of Farmer Cooperatives. We're down here at NCFC in Orlando, get together with all of our farmer cooperative friends. You engage with many groups, many organizations, but especially on grain bin safety. And this is something that you've done for many years. Absolutely. And first, let me just thank all of you at uh, This Week in Agribusiness for your continued support and helping us bring attention to this. And this matters to farmers and this matters to these co-ops we're working with as well. Everywhere grain is stored, wherever grain is stored, uh, whether it's a, a small family, family farm and a bin there, all the way up to the large bins we have going through all of our larger farmers, all the way up to the cooperative. Uh, we, we're once again, it's our 10th year, Max, of, of, uh, of, uh, which is really, really great to see 10 years of uh, focus that we tried to put on the, just how hazardous that environment is, just how hazardous it is to get inside a grain bin and, uh, you know, uh, it happens every year. Uh, in 2021, uh, there were uh, 29 reported entrapments with 11 fatalities. And uh, over the last decade, we've had 300 reported entrapments. And we, uh, we estimate there's probably at least another 30% to go unreported. So unfortunately, it's still out there, but we're just going to keep working on it and bringing attention to it. The numbers call attention to the fact that there are successful rescues. People can be brought out of there and those rescue tubes that you are helping make available to fire departments can enable those first responders to get them out of there. Well, absolutely. And, and, and you know, we're really thrilled. Prior to this year, uh, this year, our 10th installment, we have uh, helped uh, uh, provide $1 million of equipment and training. This is both from Nationwide's effort as well as our all the other partners we have in agribusiness, our insurance agents jump in, some of the larger ag companies out there, the, the, the grain and the, the corn and the soybean associations, or everyone's jumping in on this process. We've, we've done uh, uh, 270 tubes to local fire departments in over 31 states. And it's not just the equipment. You know, getting the rescue tube out to the fire department, uh, that fire department says, hey, that's great. And we have the training and how to operate. Let's let's practice on this and train. So in the, in the unfortunate event that there is an entrapment, we know exactly what to do. And we've uh, 270 of those. We've had a number of rescues. We've saved five lives that we know of, where people have come back and said, "I, you got this, this fire department saved my life." And uh, we're just going to keep pushing it, focusing on it, getting those tubes and training out there, and then really also talking to folks about 
man, zero entry would be the ideal solution. We know on the farm that isn't always possible, but just know that when you're going into that facility, just how dangerous it is. Much more information available at grainbinsafetyweek.com. I cannot imagine being entrapped in grain. And of course, quite often, those entrapped are found by neighbors or family members or friends. And yes. It's a helpless feeling. It is a helpless feeling and there's, there's nothing to do unless you've been trained and know how to handle it, Max. I did want to say a reminder before we go for the week. Next week is Valentine's Day. And if you're looking for a last minute gift for your sweetheart, North Dakota Corn and Soybean Expo <laughs> happens on Valentine's Day in Fargo next week. I'll be there. We'd love to see you before we go, Max, to the National Farm Machinery Show. Yes, we will be there too. It's, it's it's always the week of Valentine's Day. Farmers, you know, you little leaguers just starting out this game need to remember that. We, we seasoned veterans uh, have learned long ago not to forget Valentine's Day, Louisville week. We look forward to seeing you at the week ahead and next weekend here on This Week in Agribusiness. So long, everyone. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by OMAX Communication in association with 22 Creative Group. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.